The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, a freak accident. My first question was, is he alive? A young father is shocked by 12,000 volts. She said she didn't know. Hear how he survived against all odds. And then, an NBA coach with a message of forgiveness that was seen around the world. We cannot serve the Lord if we don't have a heart of forgiveness. Monty Williams story on today's 700 Club. Assad is an animal, so says our president in a battle of tweets. We hope the tweets aren't merely for show. We hope it's backed up by some force because he's been threatened before. We've talked about a red line and all this, but he's used chemical weapons again against one of his own cities, and little children are dying in Syria. Uh, Trump says there'll be a big price to pay for using chemical weapons. And uh, the president also blasted Vladimir Putin and Iran for supporting Syria. So what is the world going to do? They're waiting to see, is the U.S. actually going to move on this or let him get away with it? Well, meanwhile, there was another military action in Syria today, a missile strike on an air base. Dale Hurd tells us who's being blamed for that attack. Russia says it was two Israeli F-15 warplanes flying through Lebanese airspace that carried out the strikes on the airbase in central Syria today. The strike reportedly killed at least 14 people, including Iranians active in Syria. Syrian state media first blamed the United States for the attack, but the Pentagon said it wasn't us, and Israel's foreign ministry had no comment. Today's strike came after another chemical weapons attack Saturday against Syrian civilians, and after President Trump had tweeted, many dead, including women and children, in mindless chemical attack in Syria. President Putin, Russia, and Iran are responsible for backing animal Assad. Big price. In a Syrian hospital, victims gasping for air, men, women, and children. The gas attack came just after dusk on Saturday near the capital of Damascus. More than 40 people have died. The regime of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, backed by the Russians, deny using chemical weapons and claim this video was fabricated. While the U.S. says it did not attack the Syrian airbase today, the White House is not ruling out a future military response. Yeah, I wouldn't take anything off the table. These are horrible photos. We're looking into the attack at this point. And Republican Senator Lindsey Graham is urging the president to take strong action, calling on him to show a resolve that President Obama never did in order to get the situation in Syria right. Well, it's a defining moment in his presidency because he has challenged Assad in the past not to use chemical weapons. We had a one and done uh, uh, a missile attack, so Assad's at it again. But President Trump can reset the table here. To me, I would destroy Assad's air force. I would create safe zones in Syria. Trump will meet with his senior military leadership today, which is also the first day on the job for new national security advisor John Bolton who in the past has advocated strong military action against Syria. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dale. Uh, it looks like uh, one report has as many as eight different chemical attacks since Trump has become president. He's got to act on it. He has no, no choice anymore. You know, the amazing thing about this Assad is he was trained as a physician in Europe. He, he isn't just some uh, bumpkin from out of the... Uh, goat herds, uh, goat pens in, in central Syria. He's a sophisticated man. And to, to do this kind of uh, barbaric act is just uh, it's mind boggling. I can't understand it. I really can't. But he's got to be dealt with. And what Lindsey Graham said, absolutely destroy his Air Force, get in there and, and blow his uh, military capability to pieces. And then, and don't let the Russians deter you. Get in there regardless. And, and, and listen, Putin will back off. He's not about to take on the United States and have a war over Syria. He won't do it. Well, in just a few minutes, we'll show you how Israel has been helping victims of the Syrian civil war. But first, in other news, North Korea says it's ready to make a big step 
toward a peaceful solution of its nuclear standoff with the U.S. and the world. Ephraim Graham has that. Pat, for the first time, North Korea has told the U.S. it is prepared to discuss the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The confirmation comes from Pyongyang directly. This discussion will take place when Kim Jong-un meets with President Donald Trump. The Trump administration hopes to hold that summit late next month. But there could still be some stumbling blocks in talks about North Korea dropping its nuclear and missile tests. The North may want concessions the U.S. or other countries like South Korea aren't prepared to give. But the announcement does offer the potential for a diplomatic breakthrough. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban decisively won re-election Sunday, and his party appeared to have won a supermajority in the parliament. He calls it a, quote, opportunity to defend Hungary. Orban has said the country needed a government dedicated to Christian values. Orban also strongly warned against Islamic immigration in Europe, calling it a threat to European Christian culture. Critics worry Orban will use his power to intensify his attacks on immigration. His critics have called him a racist and a xenophobe, but the people of Hungary clearly support him. Back here at home, two-thirds of the people who leave the prison system will return. And while lawmakers on Capitol Hill, along with the White House, are working to make changes in the legal system, Amber Strong has the story of a national ministry making its own changes, one inmate at a time, to give them a second chance. The Trump administration has designated April Second Chance Month. Sean Hopwood says he knows a little something about that. My story starts with having to stand before a federal judge in 1998 as he sentenced me to 12 years and three months in federal prison. His story has a lot in common with other testimonies heard at Prison Fellowship's prayer walk. And it also has something in common with the 600,000 men and women who will be released from prison this year. But one thing was different for Hopwood. He was released and never looked back. I found that I had an aptitude for the law and I started helping other prisoners while I was there. Hopwood had a valuable skill, but even for him, the road from prison to success wasn't easy. It was really hard. It was the height of the recession. No one was finding work, let alone the guy that just did 11 years in federal prison. For most offenders, it's a vicious cycle, release and repeat. In fact, two-thirds of offenders end up back in prison. People, when they leave prison, face a lot of obstacles, trying to find employment, trying to find, um, get access to education, um, the right to vote. For 40 years, Prison Fellowship has used the love of Christ, along with mentorship and job training, to overturn those obstacles. That extra help can mean the difference between reformation and recidivism. We do a lot of work inside prisons to prepare people for that reentry time, um, and then we link them with churches uh, once they're released um, so that they can find a welcoming place uh, when they go home. That was certainly the case for Samuel Perez. Uh, prison Fellowship um, has been instrumental in just uh, really just providing opportunities. After bouncing from group home to group home, Perez found his family in the streets, leading to a life of crime and eventually 11 and a half years in prison. While this was one of the lowest points of my, my, my life, uh, it was also one of the best uh, because this was around the time that um, I began to pursue my relationship with Jesus Christ, or really he began to pursue me. The recent Liberty University graduate says even though God may have forgiven him, that didn't mean society had. Regardless of the, the, the changes that you make, regardless of how far removed you are from the crimes that you've committed, uh, you're always labeled as an ex-felon. He's been there and now works with Prison Fellowship to help former inmates. Hopwood is doing the same, but through the legal system. I do litigation on behalf of people. Recently, the Georgetown Law Professor was featured on 60 Minutes. It catapulted him into the limelight, the White House, and at the center of policy change. Can't say we're the land of liberty on one hand and on the other recognize that we incarcerate our citizens at a greater rate than almost any other country on the planet. He says success also takes the love of the community. Most every successful reentry story I've ever seen involved community. Hopwood says that community is often found in the church. After all, new beginnings are at the heart of the gospel message. If you believe in grace and redemption, you have to believe in giving second chances to people who've committed crimes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Amber Strong, CBN News, Washington. Breaking cycles, one inmate at a time. Pat. Thank you. You know, ladies and gentlemen, we did a series about uh, a nation of criminals. 
And I think the amount of, uh, of a legal penalty that's found in the laws are just extraordinary. There's hardly one single human being in America who doesn't break some law because there's so many rules and regulations, many of which you don't even know exist. And the amount of incarceration in America is just incredible. You know, the whole idea, we'll just lock them up. Whoever they are, just lock them up. And uh, yeah, I'm for law and order. Therefore, let's give them bigger sentences. This is an insanity. You should think the United States of America has a higher prison uh, uh, incarceration rate than any other nation on the face of the earth, including Russia and China. I mean, who ever heard of such a thing? We've got people behind bars and the whole idea of, you know, possession of a couple of ounces of marijuana or something like that gets somebody a jail sentence. And the possession, uh, I mean, the sentences were so extreme, five and ten years for the uh, possession of a small quantity of uh, some controlled substance. It was insanity. And we, we haven't fixed it yet. It's still got to be fixed. And uh, especially all the criminal sanctions that are put into uh, administrative rules. And I, I would recommend immediately, just immediately, uh, just zeroing out all the criminal sanctions that have been put in by administrative agencies, every single one of them. And then the ones that are passed by Congress, that's a different matter. But I, I think to have this huge weight of incarceration is so expensive and it's so costly in human lives. And uh, yes, something's got to be done, but the fact, you know, they get to prison and what do they have? With it? Well, they're schools for crime. They aren't being rehabbed. They're, they're being uh, trained to be criminals. Terry? Thank you. Well, up next, there are men and women who've willingly gone directly into a war zone, all because that's what good neighbors do. First thing I saw was hospital, I remember walking down the stairs and I remember smelling the blood and then just walking in and being like, oh my goodness, what did I get myself into? Hear how the victims of a civil war are getting much needed help from an unlikely source. Well, the Syrian civil war that began in March of 2000 has left hundreds of thousands dead. Millions of refugees have fled the country, and millions more are refugees within their own homeland. But in the midst of all this danger and chaos, the nation of Israel is working to change hearts and save lives. Watch this. Inside Syria, a bloody civil war has raged for nearly seven years. For the most part, Israel has stayed out of the war. But how could the Jewish state respond to this crisis and to the people on the other side? They decided to be a good neighbor. How far away is that fighting? Half a mile. Marco Moreno served in the Israeli military intelligence for 25 years. After the Syrian civil war began, the army assigned Moreno to come up with a response to the carnage. In the end, we took a very unique path. The path was uh, to offer humanitarian aid to the Syrian side, meaning uh, food, medicine, medical treatment, and help them in their uh, tough hour. But asking nothing in return. Yeah, yeah. asking nothing in return. It's kind of uh, thinking outside the box, and it, you know, it's not something that you can find usually as a set of mind mm -hmm. in the Israeli army. This outside-the-box plan became the Good Neighbor Project. After several years, it's provided tons of food, fuel, and supplies to Syrians on the other side of the border. The military also brought thousands in need of medical treatment into Israel, despite the warlike relationship with the Syrian government. The goal is simple. To gain the hearts of mind. We said, listen, Syrian, we are your neighbors, okay? We don't want to hurt you. We don't want only to, to love you and help you. In order to live in, in peace, as neighbors, good neighbors. And as you say, that it's a game changer? It is a game changer. <clears throat> what struck me as one of the most profound dimensions of the whole story was that these were man-to-man, eyeball-to-eyeball, relational equity and trust. And that struck me, and I wanted to get involved in that. 
Moreno enlisted Dalton Thomas, the founder of Frontier Alliance International, to send Christian medical teams inside Syria. And the thing is, they don't have anything over there. So they want and need everything on a medical level. The hospitals have all been bombed, the doctors have been assassinated or displaced. There's, there isn't anyone over there. But who would go into what's become the most dangerous place on earth? One story that compelled me is the story of the Good Samaritan. Emmanuel led the first team in and found his neighbors bleeding and dying. You have everything from chronic disease, whether it's diabetes, blood pressure, and you have uh, somebody who has his leg blown up or his gut spilling out or every kind of trauma that you can imagine. The conditions are abysmal. First thing I saw was hospital. I remember walking down the stairs and I remember smelling because they had a lot of traumas that day and I remember smelling the blood and then just walking in and being like, oh my goodness, what did I get myself into? Brittany also found herself in the war zone. She came with Tanya, a surgeon, and Melanie, a translator. They all went into Syria to help those caught in the crossfire. As chief surgeon, Dr. Tanya faced procedures she never saw in civilian life. At the moment I began the surgery, I felt like God would show me how to proceed, whether it was a C-section, a hemorrhage, amputations or traumas, like skull or vertebrate or any type of trauma. But why go in to such a dangerous place? If anything, when I read the Bible, what I see is, is a God who is mighty in battle, a God who intervenes in a, in a time of dire distress or need. Um, so when I read that, it's easy for me to trust God, that God would protect me, that God would shelter me. And if he calls, I believe he will protect us well. They are warriors, warriors. How? You have two kinds of warriors. One is carrying a gun, protecting his nation, fighting whatever, like I was for 25 years. The other kind of warrior, it's a warrior with the Bible, with a true belief in his heart. In order to serve the Lord, he needs to do what he needs to do. Syria, it's the dangerous place on earth. Everything can happen in Syria, everything. And they live in bad houses without hot water, bad food, they don't have any toilet sleeping sometimes on the ground, but they are believers. They're doing it because they love Israel, because they love Jesus, and they want to help, in the name of Jesus, the Muslims. This is a very honorable thing. God put his love in me, and it was his love that compelled me to go to that place, in spite of the risks. Away from the operating room, Dr. Tanya learned how to make bread Syrian style. <laughs> While they came as neighbors, they left as family. Welcomed in almost immediately as a part of the family um, because there was no one else there. How quickly I fell in love with the people and the community. They were amazing people and so the day that we left was probably one of the hardest days of my life, just with leaving these people that I had grown to love so much. The dynamic here is it's a threefold court. You know, it's three ropes that have been intertwined together and the bond is so tight. But who would have thought that Syrian Arab Sunni Muslims, Christian laborers, and the Israeli army. And the bond between the three is amazing. I think it in itself is a phenomenon and a miracle. As believers, as Christian, I believe our life is not our own to start with. So I come from that perspective, is the fact that because Jesus has given his life to me, all I can do is give my life back to him and allow him to write the story of my life. So however that story is, I am pretty comfortable with that. Yeah. They're really doing this because of the audience of one, that he sees it and it matters to him. And he's the one that's motivated this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the most beautiful part about it, because at the end of the day, everything comes down to the question of, is, is he worth it? Indeed, the harvest is ripe, <laughs> and uh, the Lord is doing something amazing in the Middle East, making a way where there is no way for his message for the gospel. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the Syrian-Israeli border. The Bible says about Israel that, quote, nations will come to your light. 
And that prophecy rings true to this day. Both the Jewish state and its citizens are volunteering to rescue people in desperate need all around the world. For more on this, be sure to watch The 700 Club all next week as we premiere segments from the new documentary, To Life. I think you'll find it fascinating. Well, up next, a young husband and father is hit with 12,000 volts of electricity. When you get to the hospital and you can just smell burnt flesh everywhere. The doctor told us he's not going to make it. Watch how this miracle man defies his doctors when we come back. Hey, welcome back. You're watching The 700 Club. We're so happy to have you with us. One second, Zach Short was about to climb up on a farm combine. The next second, 12,000 volts of electricity shot through his body. Doctors told Zach's family that he wasn't going to make it, but he did, thanks to the power of prayer. The soybean harvest was going as expected for Zach Short and his crew until a call came over the radio that a combine had started smoking. When Zach arrived, he went to climb on the combine to investigate, but no one realized it had come in contact with a low-hanging power line. 12,000 volts of electricity shot through Zach's body. With Zach's hand still gripping the ladder, the crew used a plastic shovel to pry him free and called 911. EMS Shane Pearson responded to the call. The biggest thing I noticed right off the bat was his feet. His work boots had just kind of been blown open. He was in a very critical condition at that point. Zach was transported to the nearest hospital. At the time, his wife Jody was at home with their one-year-old daughter, Brindley. I got a phone call that Zach had been in an accident, and my first question was, is he alive? Because I had no idea how bad the accident was. And it was his mom on the phone, and she said she didn't know. Jody rushed to the hospital with Zach's parents. When you get to the hospital and you can just smell burnt flesh everywhere, it's pretty bad. I knew how bad it was. They told us that he was going to be flown to a different hospital. And that's when it really hit, hit us that this is, this is not good. Zach was life flighted to Vi Christie Hospital in Wichita, Kansas, and admitted into their burn center. Dr. Robert Bingaman was the attending physician. He had some of the deepest uh, electrical injuries I had ever seen. Both of his lower extremities were uh, severely burned. And, uh, actually, uh, areas on his feet and ankles were charred. The chances of living were no better than 50-50. Doctors put Zach into a medically induced coma and worked around the clock to treat his burns. They were able to stabilize him, but he was in critical condition. Jody prayed and spread the word over social media. Farmers that live around here would stop their farm equipment every day at um, 10 and 4 and pray for Zach. Three days later, he went into cardiac arrest. The nurses um, pulled me in the room and the doctor while he was coding. They were performing chest compressions on him. And we were just behind him rallying, saying, come on, Zach, come on, Zach, come back to us, Zach. And, and, he, and then finally, the nurse had said, we've got, we've got a pulse. But as quickly as Zach's heart recovered, his kidneys began shutting down, and his lungs started filling with fluid. The doctor told us he's not going to make it. He basically told us to tell him goodbye. So I took our daughter in and told her that he was going, going to heaven. Friends and family gathered at the hospital and waited for him to pass. But they soon realized God was still at work. Blood pressure started to come up and oxygen saturation levels started to come up. And uh, and he began to stabilize. The doctor said, I, th I think he's going to make a liar out of me. <laughs> I don't, I don't, he's getting better. God was, it was he was in the room with us. <laughs> he was there and he was answering people's prayers. 
But there's no doubt in my mind that God touched Zach that night and, and turned things around and gave him a chance. Over the next couple of weeks, Zach continued to improve. His kidneys started working and his lungs started to empty and the doctor was just like, I've never seen anything like this before. Unfortunately, doctors had to amputate Zach's lower legs because of infection. It would save his life, but now they had another concern, whether Zach had suffered brain damage. The only way to find out was to bring him out of the coma. When I woke up in the hospital, it was like I had a whole bunch of dreams. I kind of knew what happened, but not really at the same time. And my wife was the first one to come in there. My first question was, do you remember me? And he, of course, he said, I'm not going to forget you and Brinley. <laughs> And then she said, well, you, you remember you, you got shocked in the field, and that's why right there it clicked in my head. I remembered exactly what happened. The next three months would be hard, as Zach struggled through extensive physical therapy and multiple surgeries. I would definitely get angry and break down quite a bit. I just kept praying and, and thought, you know, there's, there's a lot of people out there that care about me. I have a lot to live for still. I just got to keep trying, and, and God kind of showed me the light. Then on Valentine's Day, Zach was released to go home. His town welcomed him in the streets. I couldn't believe it. I broke down when we drove through him because there was people out there with signs saying, we love you, Zach. He says, how am I going to thank all these people? And I says, you know, from what I can see, they want to thank you because you brought them back to their faith. Zach has become accustomed to his new legs and is thankful to get back to farming and being a husband and a father. In fact, he and Jody are expecting their second child, a boy. If it wasn't for all the prayers, God wouldn't have heard that we needed a miracle, many, many miracles, and we wouldn't have received the miracle that we got. You looked at what the doctor's reports were and how bad my injuries were, and there's nothing that explains my recovery, but, you know, God watching over me. What a marvelous miracle, and what a great guy, and what a lovely wife, and what a great community. The fact that they all join together and pray for him is beautiful. God answers prayer, folks. Now, here's one that came in to us. A lady named Laurie wrote to our inbox and said, quote, I have suffered from depression for some time. Today I was watching the 700 Club. Terry mentioned somebody who had been struggling with depression. My entire body got hot. And I felt the depression lift. I began to laugh and felt such joy, and I haven't had any trouble since. Praise Terry, God. You didn't know Lori, did you? I still don't know Lori, you but still I sure am happy for you, that Lori. great? Yes, that's amazing. She felt hot and then yeah. began to just laugh and praise the Lord. What do you have? Well, this is Angela Pat. She wrote into our inbox and said, after my husband's mother died, we began hearing weird noises in the house. It caused intense and paralyzing fear. One day I was watching the 700 Club when Pat had a word of knowledge about someone who was terribly fearful and scared. I claimed the word, we prayed, the noises stopped, and the fear left. Perfect love casts out fear, for fear has torment. Folks, we're going to pray for you now. Are you ready? Now, we're going to ask you to believe God with us. Now, with God, all things are possible. Nothing is impossible with God. He created the world. He created everything. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. There's nothing impossible. Seeing my hand has made all these things, says the Lord. Now, Terry and I are going to join hands together. We're going to believe God for you. And all we ask you to do is please just receive it. Receive. What do you need? Is it depression? Is it, uh, well, it's schizophrenia? Is it some terrible uh, mental problem? Uh, is it some physical problem you've had for a long time? Whatever it is, God will take care of it. Mm -hmm. Father, Jeez. I join with my dear sister in Christ, and we pray together. And we thank you for Zach, what you did with him, a miracle, Lord. And we think of others in this audience who've had trauma. Mm. There's somebody who, who, there's some kind of a saw, there was a buzz saw or something that really cut you up badly. You, you've suffered really serious trauma. God is healing that flesh, and there's a creative miracle taking place in, in your, your, I believe the name is George, taking place right now. Terry? 
Uh, there's someone else. You have some kind of a condition that I, I don't... You'll know it because the word that the doctors that you see uses, your skin sloughs off. Um, I, I don't know what your condition is, but I know that God is healing that for you right now, even though there's really no cure for what you're suffering from. But in Him, there is an answer. Somebody else with severe burns, you, you're in a, a burn unit and you, 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 oh, your whole flesh has been torn up with, with severe burns, but God is, is healing you. The touch is there, and that awful pain is leaving even as I speak. Terry, you Yeah, there's someone else here. You have a, you're sick right now, and they're, you're th for, your throat is just like there are razor blades cutting when you swallow. God's healing your condition. You will be up by the end of the day and healed completely. In the name of Jesus, Amen. receive an answer to your prayer. Wherever you are, whoever you are, may the touch of God be in Thank your you. life right now. Amen. amen and amen. And amen. Wherever you are, give us a call. We would love to hear from you. It's just simple. It's an easy number to remember. It's 1-800-800 to get you into the uh, long distance uh, line. It's toll free. And then it's 707,000. If you're in this area code, you're right close to it. It's just 707,000. Just dial that number. Somebody's on the phone who would love to hear the good news or take a prayer request, whatever you have. Those counselors are here 24 hours a day. Terry? Well, coming up later, how an NBA exec found hope during the darkest days of his life and wound up inspiring millions along the way. Monty Williams shares his story later on today's 700 Club. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Hundreds of people gathered Sunday night to honor the lives of the 15 Canadian hockey players. The Humboldt Broncos were headed to a game Friday when they collided with a semi-trailer. That crash killed 15 players and team personnel. Another 14 people were hurt. People gathered in the team's home arena to pray and to offer their condolences. CBN International is using the internet to teach the gospel and reach people in China. China now has access to a video platform called 7G. The videos provide new content each day, including testimonies and interviews with Chinese Christians. 7G also uses social media to reach new audiences. Nearly 7,000 people are watching each day. Between this new platform and the Chinese version of YouTube, there have been more than 88 million video views of the good news of the gospel. You can learn more about what CBN is doing around the world by visiting cbn.com slash international. We'll be back with much more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Two years ago, a woman with a dog on her lap and meth in her blood was going twice the speed limit in downtown Oklahoma City. Before long, she lost control of her SUV, crossed lanes, and crashed head-on into a car coming in the opposite direction. The second car was being driven by a mother of five named Ingrid Williams, and she died from her injuries the following day. At her funeral, her now-widowed husband, NBA coach Monty Williams, delivered the eulogy. And what he said next was soon heard around the world. Psalm 73, 1 says, God is good. And 1 John 4, 16 says, God is love. During times like this, it's easy to forget that. It didn't take long for Monty Williams' touching eulogy for Ingrid, his wife of 20 years, to go viral. But it wasn't because of his status as an NBA player or coach. It was for the message of forgiveness he offered the woman who killed her in a car accident and her family. Everybody's praying for me and my family, which is right. But let us not forget that there were two people in this situation. And that family needs prayer as well. And we have no ill will towards that family. It was February 9, 2016. Monty was told that a driver under the influence of meth crossed lanes and hit Ingrid's car with three of their children inside. The kids suffered minor injuries, but Ingrid was in the hospital fighting for her life. It was the slowest time of my life. Uh, once I got the news, 
um, to the time that I heard that it wasn't going well um, to my few last few seconds with her. Um, it was all slow and the thing that I remember clearly is everything was really simple. Uh, not much mattered. Uh, it was just me and the Lord. And it wasn't a wrestling match or any of that stuff that you hear about. It was just a, a pleading for God to intervene. But despite all of their efforts, Ingrid passed away the following evening. You know, I, I was in this this part of my life that had changed in a split second and it brought me right to um, a kind of anger that um, was indescribable. And I was upset about what happened. I was upset about my children, children having to live their life without their mom, um, me going forward without Ingrid and the whys. Monty and Ingrid were college sweethearts at the University of Notre Dame. And he learned about having faith in Jesus Christ from her. She was the most consistent uh, example of graciousness that I had met. And I, had, I didn't even know what grace meant when I was 17, 18 years old. I just knew that the things that I read about in the Bible, I was seeing it in her. Through Ingrid's example and prayers, Monty accepted Jesus Christ into his heart. And as Monty entered the NBA, the two married and started a family. For the next 20 years as a player and coach, Monty leaned on God and Ingrid as they followed God's direction for their lives. You know, again, you're spending all these years in a league that's changing. It's a roller coaster <laughs> ride. I mean, you got, you don't know what turns, yeah. what dips, what tunnels are coming. Yeah. How has your faith helped you stay resilient through through all of that. Yeah, I think Colossians 3.23 has always been a, a verse for me um, in Matthew 6.33. Um, doing my work as unto the Lord and seeking God first. I think those have been a lighthouse for me with the ups and downs of the NBA. But when Ingrid was killed, Monty didn't know how to move forward. But he found his first steps toward healing during a meeting with a pastor. It just it was the Lord, because Brett Metter, um, who was the father and pastor from Oregon, he was talking about forgiveness. And somehow, some way, the Lord impressed it on my heart to make sure that my kids understood that. A message that through Ingrid's eulogy, no Monty wanted us. others to understand as well. In my house, we have a sign that says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We cannot serve the Lord if we don't have a heart of forgiveness. How essential was forgiveness um, in helping you to heal? Yeah, I think it took, forgiveness took the focus off of um, the accident and, and it really brought me before the Lord um, because I was really disappointed in how it all went down. I wasn't disappointed in anyone. I was really disappointed in the Lord because I know how awesome God is. And I know that um, it could have gone the other way. And I just couldn't understand that, and I still don't. I don't question God. I don't question His love for me. I don't like what happened. I don't like this part of the plan. And I know that God's going to do more with what happened with us than He could do in any other situation with or without me. And I wanna be a part of it. Today, Monty is married to Lisa and currently serves as Vice President of Basketball Operations for the Spurs organization. And as he continues pressing forward, he's using every opportunity to lead people to Jesus Christ. What message has the Lord given you to give? Gosh, I think um, quitting is okay. Just don't stay there, you know. It, it, it'd be easy for me to sit here and say that I've been strong through this whole deal, but that's, that's just not the case, man. Um, I've had days where I just gave up and the Lord picked me up. 
the strength that he provides, you know, we we're able to continue to go forward. And I, I want that to be the message out of all this is how God brings you through all of the stuff. And so to be able to share that with my kids and, and God using that through us to do whatever he's going to do in the kingdom. That's an awesome thing that I can't lose sight of. Now that's an amazing message that you can take to the bank. Oh, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a, such a hard thing, I think, Pat, for yeah. people to accept that God, who can change circumstances and can override things, chooses not to sometimes, and it's hard to accept when we can't see the reason. The fact that the woman who killed his wife yeah. was high on meth, holding a little dog in her lap, you know, driving at an excessive rate of speed, and he had every reason to be bitter. Instead of that, he said, I'm going to forgive. That's what God wants me to do, and I want to please the Lord. I mean, it was beautiful. I mean, absolutely beautiful. But that is what Christ tells us to do. Mm -hmm. Forgive those who despitefully use you, persecute you, and suffer. You know, it's just magnificent. And, you know, I think the other thing that's so great about that is his recognition that God has a plan. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean he doesn't have it. And he doesn't want to miss out on being a part of that. (laughs) You don't either. So read the word and then live the word. Well, coming up, get ready for an all new edition of Your Questions, Honest Answers. Kathy asks, since Satan is a spirit, will he ever be born? and have a body. Pat weighs in on that and more when we come back. When Mr. and Mrs. Zhao realized their two daughters were going deaf, they worked tirelessly to get them the help they needed. But after emptying their savings, they were only able to afford one pair of second-hand hearing aids for one child. They said they were at a dead end until they heard about CBN. Mrs. Zhao always got scared when it came time to cross busy streets with her two girls and often carried her younger daughter, Yo-Yo. I was afraid I would get hit by a car because neither one of them could hear a thing. By the time they turned two, they'd both gone deaf. When the doctor said they could never be cured, it felt like my sky went dark and I wanted to die. I wished I could give them my ears. The Zhao's worried that their girls would not be able to go to school, find jobs, or get married they will be looked down on for the rest of their lives. The couple used their entire savings and still could only afford hearing aids for their older daughter, and they were secondhand. Secondhand hearing aids are loud and make the sound of a cicada, like constant high-pitched chirping, and made it hard to learn anything. So the couple started working harder to save for new hearing aids for both girls. Mrs. Zhao got a job assembling bottle caps, but only made 35 cents a day. She also sold her blood. Mr. Zhao got a higher paying job out of town in construction and tried to sell their house, but there were no buyers. I was at a dead end. Sometimes I hated myself for not being able to help my daughters. I hope some people would donate hearing aids. Soon, a teacher told the Zhao's about CBN, and we made sure both sisters got brand new top-of-the-line hearing aids. We also paid for their language training. These hearing aids are great. There's no extra noise in them, so both of my daughters can learn and play like other kids. It gives me so much joy in my heart. Now my girls can speak in sentences and express themselves well. They can get jobs, get married. They will have options in life. Thank you so much for your help. It's brought us so much hope. Now all my worry is gone. I cannot imagine what it would be like as a parent to see a child, much less two of my children, have such deep need. And no matter how hard I worked, I could never make enough to be able to do something to dent the problem. 
you know, there's a hopelessness that comes with that. But 700 Club members, I want you to know that you are the bearers of hope to people all around the world who find themselves in desperate circumstances. You bring answers, not a handout, a hand up. You're changing families, changing communities, changing nations. And we want to say thank you. What does that look like? Well, it's a team of people, thousands of us that have come together. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. Many of you have joined us at higher levels levels. But for those of you who haven't joined yet, today's a great day to do it. Pat mentioned earlier, our number's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. You can call right now. Say I want to join the 700 Club and know that immediately your gift is being given into the lives of people with desperate needs. You're giving hope. Our way of saying thank you is to send you Pat's latest DVD. It's called Answered Prayer. He's been in ministry for more than 50 years and he talks about the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. How do we pray? and get answers. We want you to have this. We think it'll be a blessing. In fact, this is Dan who lives in Starkville, Mississippi, who's already received his copy and listened to it. He says, we enjoyed your answered prayer DVD very much. The stories were awesome. It was good to be reminded of how important it is to make sure there is no unforgiveness in our hearts when we pray. We were blessed. So people being changed, Pat, by that teaching. All right. Well, we've got some Question. time for Q&A here. We want to take right. some of your answers. This comes from Kathy, who says, since Satan is a spirit, will he ever be born and have a body? I wonder the same thing about the Holy Spirit. Well, spirits don't get born. I mean, he is a spirit and he's what he is. But uh, he is a fallen spirit. And I think his rebellion against God was so horrible that there's not any chance of him being redeemed. And he's certainly not going to have a body. He doesn't need a body. He's a spirit. And But the Bible says that there's a lake of fire reserved for the devil and his angels. So that's where he's going to go. All right. Okay, this is George who says, Dear Pat, I want your advice on something that has troubled me for some years. It concerns the timeline of the crucifixion and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospels all record that Jesus was crucified on Friday morning and was buried in a tomb before sunset that same day. He was resurrected on the following Sunday. Jesus himself, however, spoke of this in Matthew 12, 40, saying, For as Jonah was was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Can you give me insight as to why the prophetic words by Jesus were different than the record of the actual events, according to the writers of the Gospels? I think you've put several days in that first thing that aren't there. Uh, you say he was resurrected on a, a Sunday, like a week later or something. I mean, it, you add three days. I mean, first of all, he was crucified on a Friday. We talk about Good Friday. So it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And Sunday was the day. So I, I don't know what the problem is, but the, 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 that's three days. Yeah, okay. I think it's because it says three days and three nights that he's wondering uh, why not that. Yeah. I, I, he was there. The time frame works out according to what the Bible says. I think you've, you've added some time in by saying, well, I think uh, it was like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday kind of thing. Okay. I, I may it, be wrong, but I, I, I think... The Bible is correct. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is Sandy who says, My husband and I were both previously married and our ex-spouses are still living. Through our Bible study and learning, we feel we should not stay married as we're living in sin against God's word. We want to ensure we both go to heaven when we die and want to be obedient to God no matter how painful it would be or the hardship it would cause to both of us. We're very concerned and conflicted on what we should do. Please help us to understand what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Well, you know, if a spouse dies, the remaining spouse is not bound. That's for starters. There's also uh, the Pauline privilege. If the unbelieving spouse walks away from marriage, the believer is not bound in that case. Jesus said, except for fornication or uh, immorality, you know, that uh, you, you're supposed to stay married. But uh, I don't know, in your case, was there any uh, immorality? Uh, if both of you just went ahead and, and got divorced and you got remarried, uh, I'm, I'm not sure there's any scriptural ground for that. And I, I don't know where you are. You haven't given me enough information to give you an intelligent answer. But what, do you think they should, they should divorce again? It's like, do two wrongs make a right? That's kind well, of Well, they, they don't really, but at the same time, 
you're asking something really tough, and uh, I think you need to go to a pastor or somebody and 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 explain all the circumstances and then get an answer rather than something on a television program. I really, that's what I would prefer. Well, thank you so much for those questions. We leave you with today's power message from Psalm 91. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Well, tomorrow, at home with eight-time all-star Daryl Strawberry, who's going to open up about what almost was destroyed his life and his career. Well, thank you for being with us. So Terry and I, we wish you the very best, and we will look forward to seeing you tomorrow. So God bless you. Bye-bye.